Uh, just a brief bio about the, our speaker tonight. Uh, Dr. Nisha graduated uh, from Northwestern University. Uh, later, he graduated with high honors from Robert Wood Johnson's Medical School in 2005. Dr. Shah completed his residency at the New Jersey Medical Center Hackensack School University. And currently, Dr. Shah is chairman of surgery at Robert Wood Johnson Center in Somerset. Dr. Shah has been instrumental in bringing new technologies in his uh, area, and uh, his uh, work has been very relevant, uh, especially to us. So Dr. Shah will talk about this evening about prostate enlargement, prostate carcinoma, and uh, also ED, which might uh, interest us as well. So Dr. Shah. Thank you for the introduction. It's a great turnout. I should have brought more gloves for the post uh, talk uh, prostate exams later. So, um, you know, uh, basically I've been in practice for about 13 years in Somerville and now in Hillsborough. Our practice does everything from robotic surgery to kidney stones, to prostate enlargement, uh, kidney cancer, bladder cancer. So it's almost one-stop shopping for urology. But I wanted to talk a lot about prostate enlargement and we'll finish about erectile dysfunction. These are issues that as men get older, um, we'll face, you know, the, one of the things we can't control, unfortunately, is age. And as we get older, these are things that become more and more prominent uh, in our uh, daily lives. So we'll, there we go. So basically, I just wanted to talk about what is the prostate? You know, the only thing I, I joke that the only thing it does as we get older is cause more problems. But it's basically part of the male reproductive system. And so what it does is when you ejaculate, it makes the semen more liquidy. So really, that's about it. <laughs> and then after that, it just causes problems. The other issue is why it does cause issues with urination is it basically circles your urine channel. It's called a urethra. And so you can imagine as the prostate gets larger, it squeezes the urethra, basically. Think about the Grand Canyon. As it closes in, the urine or the river gets smaller and smaller. That's what the prostate does. And that's what we'll talk about how it leads to uh, problems. In addition, it's in front of the rectum. And that's why many of you will go to your uh, doctor and get a prostate exam th through the rectum because we can actually feel it, which gives us an idea of the size. Next slide. So this is just the, a little bit of the anatomy. You can see the, the tip of the penis where you, the urine comes out is at the bottom. And as you go backwards, that's your urethra. And then your prostate, um, hold on. You guys can hear, right? So. Your bladder here. And what happens is, oh, thanks. And what happens is as the prostate gets enlarged, your bladder is like a muscle. It's just like your bicep. The, the more obstruction there is, the bladder gets thicker and thicker. It's just like if you started lifting weights in your gym, your biceps would get thicker. And that's also a sign as your bladder wall gets thicker that there could be some underlying prostate enlargement. So who is at risk for uh, prostate enlargement? One of the things is, so basically men over 50 um, start developing prostate enlargement. So the Mayo Clinic, Harvard, they've done studies and they've taken men in their 40s and 50s. Basically, by the time men are in their 80s, almost 100% of men will have prostate enlargement. And it's an exponential rise. It's not a slow rise over time. That doesn't mean every person with a big prostate is going to have medicines or surgery, but that's just what happens as men get older. Two, I see a lot of men who are younger who come see me in their 40s and I'll ask, oh, did your dad have any prostate issues? And sure enough, they, their father did. And so those men present earlier with symptoms of uh, enlarged prostate, which we'll get into. Obesity also plays a role. Um, we've seen that people who have, uh, who have poor diets, they have more prostate problems. Uh, so obesity definitely does affect prostate growth. 
And also, you also see um, there's a connection between enlargement of the prostate and erection issues. And so one of the medications we'll talk about earlier, actually uh, called Tadalafil, which is Cialis, actually there is approved for both prostate enlargement and erectile dysfunction. So again, the epidemiology, as I said, it affects over 70% of men in their 60s, 80%, probably more like 90% over 70. Usually men in their 30s, you don't need to worry about it. Now, just some, some, some semantics. So usually we use the word enlarged prostate. To say BPH, which is benign uh, prostatic hyperplasia, is more if someone had a prostate biopsy, which some of you men have had here, and where that just means it's non-cancerous tissue. Next. So LUTs are what they call lower urinary tract symptoms. So this describes the different symptoms men can get when their prostate gets enlarged. We kind of categorize it in three symptoms. One is what they call storage symptoms or like irritative symptoms. So if you go frequently to the bathroom or you know, you're sitting in your chair and then you stand up and you have to rush to the bathroom or you may feel like you'll have an accident, that's called urgency. Incontinence is leakage of urine. Most men develop urge incontinence where before you can get, you get that urge and before you can get to the bathroom or you get to the urinal, a little bit of urine dribbles out. That's called urge incontinence. The other one that a lot of men have is nocturia, which is getting up at night. So in general, as men get older, one to, or women too, one to two times a night is, is, is normal as people get older. Once it gets to three, four, more than that, that's a little bit more pathological, meaning that's more of a sign of prostate enlargement. The other thing about getting up at night is it's not only prostate. It can be related to fluid intake in the evenings, for example. It also could be related to if someone has um, heart problems where they get swollen legs during the day. So what happens at night, for example, all that fluid that builds up in the legs actually comes back into your body at night and you actually have to urinate it out. So that's another reason why people get up at night. Uh, another one is sleep apnea. So which is where some people use BiPAP or CPAP machines to help keep their airways open. That actually leads your body to overproduce this uh, hormone that makes you need to urinate more often. So getting up at night actually more than frequency or urgency is actually related to a lot of different things. So when people come see me just for getting up at night, we need to look at other things in our medical history, which may help us as well. So the other part of urinating symptoms is what they call voiding symptoms. So this is the kind of classic where you think, oh, I can't urinate well, it dribbles out, the stream is very weak, I don't feel like I'm emptying my bladder. So that's a, that's a different category, that's called voiding dysfunction. And then the post void where men will say, you know, they have dribbling after the, it goes in their underwear, or they feel like I just urinated, why do I feel like my bladder's full again? So those are the kind of three categories of urinary symptoms. So not you don't have to have all of them. You, some people just present with getting up at night. Some people just have the uh, weaker stream and they don't wake up at night. So it could be a constellation of these symptoms um, to kind of characterize your own symptoms. Next. So kind of what happens with the pathophysiology or meaning what happens as your prostate gets enlarged is the top line means detrusor hypertrophy, hyper, um, hypertrophy. That means your bladder gets thick walled, like I said, when your prostate gets enlarged. So then that leads your bladder to get more irritated. So the more obstructed your bladder is, the more unstable it gets. It's, it's basically just getting upset that it's not emptying well. So it becomes irritable. So that leads to you to have urgency or incontinence then your bladder can get these little stones in it, for example. So bladder stones, unlike kidney stones, which start over here and develop because maybe you're not drinking enough water, bladder stones actually develop because of prostate obstruction most of the time. So when we see bladder stones, the first thought is we think that someone has an enlarged prostate. It also can lead to urine backing up into your kidney. So when you your kidneys are here and they have tubes that drain into your bladder, and so what happens is if your bladder doesn't empty well, the urine backs up into your kidney and actually can cause kidney failure. So because it's just high pressure down in your bladder area. So that's another concern of enlargement of the prostate. You can get blood in the urine. So your prostate enlarges, it gets new blood vessels. 
And those blood vessels, if you're constipated or you lift something heavy, can actually open up and lead to having blood in the urine, which can be a sign of prostate enlargement. Urinary tract infection. So if you don't empty your bladder, think of a pond that just sits there and the water stagnant, it gets that algae on top. Same concept with your, with your urine is if you don't empty your bladder, the urine sits there, you can get infections. And the other last one is retention. That's where you try to urinate, nothing's coming out, and then you need to have a catheter, a tube placed in your penis to drain the bladder. So it can start off just as a, having a thick wall bladder, and as it progresses, you can start seeing some of these downstream effects. So how do we diagnose prostate enlargement or BPH? So obviously, you know, we want to take a history, find out what medications you're on. Because for example, if people take any water pills or diuretics, you're going to notice probably when you take them, you start going more urgently or frequently. So we want to know that. We want to know what time you take it. Because sometimes if you take it in the evening, that actually means you're going to probably get up more at night. Um, your family history, we want to know about um, if you've had any surgeries before on your prostate. Uh, and then physical exam, the big one for us is we want to do a digital rectal exam. So basically, we want to uh, feel your prostate so we can see, A, get an idea of size, and also make sure there are no hard areas on your prostate. So your prostate should feel like the tip of your nose. If it feels like your knuckle, that's a, that's a concerning sign. We also do PSA screening. So PSA is called prostate-specific antigen. So many men get that starting at age 50. It's a screening test that we use for prostate cancer. The test uh, typically is zero to four, but as men get older, the number is allowed to go up. A lot of men will have higher PSAs, even though I'm not going to talk about prostate cancer, I just want to talk about uh, PSA screening. So it is specific to the prostate, means this blood test only comes to the prostate. It's not produced in your heart, liver, kidneys, or anywhere else. So when it is high, we think of a few things, infection, um, inflammation, prostate cancer, or even as your prostate enlarges, you're going to have a higher PSA. So it's important that we check that because if we're going to think about doing any prostate surgery, we want to make sure there's no cancer first. So that's part of the workup as well. Another test that we always do is we do a urinalysis. So what we're doing is checking your urine to make sure there's no microscopic blood, and we want to make sure there's no infection. So that's why we check the urine to, for those two things. Now, the other question is, how do we know how severe someone's symptoms are? What are some other tests we can do, not only from talking to the patient or doing an exam or checking the blood work in urine? So there's subjective outcomes, and there are these objective outcomes, and we'll talk about each one. So subjective measure is, base, is called an AUA symptom score. Basically, it describes five common, uh, six common symptoms men have, which include incomplete emptying. So basically, the idea that you feel like you're not emptying your bladder. Frequency, how often you're going. Um, okay, intermittency, so basically how weak the stream is. Urgency, um, then straining and nocturia. And then you have a score. And why that's important is as if someone has a very low score from zero to seven, sometimes we just talk about just behavioral modifications, and I'll get to that in a second, or I'm not going to push you to medication. But as people's scores go up, they go from moderate to severe, most of those patients will either require medication or they'll require surgery in the future. So that's why it's important to have that score. Many times I don't have patients fill out because I can already figure out how severe their symptoms are. But that's just a subjective measure by the patient to tell us how bad their symptoms are. So we can kind of guide people on what kind of path to go on. So this is just another, um, this is just an international prostate symptom score, very similar again. And then at the bottom, what I always ask patients too is what their quality of life is due to symptoms. So some people get up, you know, they, they score a five on some of these. They get up five times a night. And I say, are you bothered? And they're like, no, I've been doing that for 30 years and I go right back to bed. And so it doesn't bother them. There are other patients who get up twice a night and are severely bothered by it. So it's important that you not only know the severity of your symptoms, but also how much it bothers you. So that's an that's a important one um, on this uh, scorecard. 
And then objective measures. So we, for some patients, we actually have you come with a full bladder and you pee in a funnel into, and then that actually measures how fast your urine flow is. And so normally it should be go to 20. And as you can see, the blue line is kind of, cause kind of this choppy pattern and it's never getting more than five. So that's usually what you see when people have enlarged prostates because the prostate's blocking the flow, so it's coming out weakly, weaker. So that's another test we can do to kind of help figure out, you know, how obstructed or if the prostate's playing a role. Next slide. The other thing we do is we do what they call as a post void residual. So you'll urinate, and then what we do is we have a little ultrasound machine in the office, and we figure out how much urine is left over. So normally. When you urinate, you shouldn't have any urine left over. But some men have half a liter in there. And I've had people come to do with two liters of urine, basically a two liter bottle of Coke in their bladder. And so when we empty it out and they're shocked and they lose five pounds, actually, once we drain their bladder. So you can retain quite a bit of bladder of urine in your bladder. So that's another test we like to do because it gives us an idea of how full the bladder is. The other test is, is what they call cystoscopy. So this is a little bit more invasive. So this is where we actually, with a small little camera, we actually look inside the penis after we numb it up or, and we look in and we actually look at the urethra to make sure there's no scar tissue. And then we look at the prostate. So what you're looking at is going into your bladder, the two sides of your prostate, you have a right and a left lobe. And you can see how it's kind of squeezing the urethra. It's not letting any urine out. And that's a sign if we look in saying, hey, your prostate's enlarged and we need to maybe take care of those lobes. So a cystoscopy is a visual inspection of your prostate to see how severely enlarged it is and A, what surgery may be, you may benefit from. Um, so that's a really important test before we uh, plan for any surgery. Um, so those are the, so in general, we'll only really do a cystoscopy if we think we're going to do surgery, but if someone comes and just is on medications and they're doing well, we're not going to do the procedure. Another procedure that we do is called a trust. That's called a transrectal ultrasound. So that's actually where we get a dimension. We actually get a prostate size. And that's really important because certain procedures work better for certain prostate sizes while others work less uh, well. So for example, a prostate normally size-wise is the size of a walnut for example. So let's say your prostate is four walnuts. You know, that's pretty big. You know, we may want to think about a different surgery than if your prostate was, let's say, a walnut and a half. So that's an important test we do to help us kind of do surgical planning. The other test we do is called the urodynamics. This is if there's some complicated um, cases where some patient may have like neurologic disease and we want to get a better picture. This is just the way to look at this is it's an EKG for your bladder. We're trying to see how your uh, bladder squeezes, just like your heart. So that's just the easy way to think about that test. So that's more of an optional test, but the other two are important before we do surgery. So we'll do just talk about just treatment from simple to a little bit more complex. So behavioral modifications. So a few things you want to try to limit caffeine. Caffeine is a diuretic, makes you need to urinate. Alcohol does the same thing. Limiting what you drink at night, that's really important. So if you were to sleep at 10, I would probably tell most of my patients to stop drinking around eight. Time voiding. So a lot of times we're on our couches watching a football game or doing whatever, and then we get up and we get that urge to urinate. So even if uh, you, it's been two hours, three hours, and you haven't gone, sometimes I'll tell my patients just get up a little bit before that, and then you won't get that strong urgency feeling when your bladder's too full. Herbal medications. A lot of patients will ask me about medications like saw palmetto, super beta prostate, anything you can find on the internet. What I tell them is there's no great evidence. If your symptoms are mild, I have no issue trying it, but it's almost like flipping a coin. You have 50% chance it's good. If it is, I have no problem with it. It doesn't affect your PSA. It doesn't affect your prostate in terms of its size, but if it works for your symptoms, you, should, you can try it always if your symptoms are mild. The next thing are what they call alpha blockers. So this is in the class where if you've heard of medications like uh, Rapaflow or Flomax, Uroxetrol, they're basically five in this class. 
this is really the way I look at it is like first line medications for a lot of men. This is kind of what we start with. There are a few reasons. One is you don't need to take this medication for months for it to work. Usually in a few weeks, sometimes under a week, you'll have a good idea if it's helping with your urinating habits. So these, this works by relaxing your prostate. So think of it as a muscle relaxant. We're not reducing the size. We're just making it more relaxed so you can urinate easier. So the goal is that you're going to have improved flow, wake up less at night, um, not have the straining or pushing, and, um, and feel like you're emptying your bladder better. The big things, the side effects that we look out for is what they call retrograde ejaculation. So that is where no ejaculate comes out. It is reversible once you stop it. Some people, the first time they take it, they can get dizzy. So that's why we tell, tell patients to take it in the evening after they eat dinner so that if they do get dizzy the first time, they're at least in bed or in their house. Um, the other, other important thing is many people here have cataracts or will may need cataract surgery. There's something called floppy iris uh, syndrome. That is an intraoperative complication during cataract surgery that is rare, but can happen when you're on flow max. So if you see your cardiologist, I'm sorry, your ophthalmologist, it's really important to have, uh, to let them know your medications, especially when it's one of these, uh, five medications. Um, otherwise, so... So we tend to use Flomax and Rapoflow more Flomax because it's generic and it's it's more affordable because it's a little bit more selective for the prostate. So you don't get as much as these ortho, the dizziness or the low blood pressure that you do with some of the ones on the left side of the screen. Thanks. Oh, you can go to the next one. We'll, we'll move on from this. Uh, and then there's another class of medication. This is called the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. Basically, what this medicine does is it, it shrinks your prostate. Um, it blocks the change of testosterone to DHT, which makes the prostate grow because your prostate's under the influence of testosterone. So there are two medications in this class, um, really no big difference between the two. But they do the same thing, which is where they reduce the size of the prostate. Unlike Flomax, the other medications which work in a few weeks, this really takes up to three to six months to work. So if someone has an acute problem where they can't urinate, starting this isn't going to help in an acute setting. It will chronically. Um, other side effects, because this is more of a hormonal drug, this can affect your sex drive. It can lead to erectile dysfunction. Some of my, it's very rare, but some people uh, get breast enlargement and some nipple tenderness. I don't see that that much, but this is another medicine that you can use. They've done studies where basically if you take both together, you do better than if you take one separately. But again, it's a conversation of some of the side effects. I'll tell you a lot of my patients when I tell them these side effects would prefer to take the other one and not this. Uh, and this is really now the newest class. This is, um, it's been FDA approved for a few years, but using Tadalafil, which is Cialis, we actually actually found out men who are taking Viagra urinating really well. So they looked into this more and they realized that these medications also help relax the prostate. So you actually have a better flow um, and it helps just as much as uh, Flomax. The difference and the improvement also is seen in one week, similar to Flomax. You don't need to take it for two months to see if there's an improvement. The downside is if anyone has any heart issues and they take nitroglycerin for their heart, um, they can't take this medication, just like you could in if, uh, for erections. So the only one that's FDA approved is, is Tadalafil, and that's five milligrams, and you take that daily. The added benefit is you also, it can also help with erections. And so you don't need to take an as needed medication. You can take this all the time. So this is, uh, between this and I think Flomax are pretty much the two medications I usually start with. And the other thing is that this doesn't usually cause dizziness, low blood pressure, and it typically um, doesn't cause um, retrograde ejaculation where the ejaculate goes backwards. So a lot of my patients like uh, like this one. Insurance, though, is the only problem. Sometimes they don't like to pay for it. Thanks. So some people also then, that's for, those meds are like, oh, I can't, you know, my stream is really weak. Then there are other people who come in because they're they have accidents a lot. They can't get to the bathroom. So there's a whole class of medications which relax your bladder. So what these do, it's it basically, if your bladder is kind of overactive and sending you these messages, hey, I need to, you know, you need to go pee, this calms your bladder down. 
The, so this one works, but you have to make sure there are a few things. One is you have to make sure no one's retaining urine first, because if you take this when you're retaining, you can um, you can go into retention where you need a catheter. Two is some people get dry eyes, dry mouth, and constipation with it. So you just have to be aware of some of these side effects. But this works. You can take all of these pills in combination. So this is another class of medication. So if anyone ever heard of a medicine called oxybutynin, um, Vesicare, Enablex, um, Det um, Detrol, these are th those type of medications. And there's another one that's out called Mirbetric. This also works to relax your bladder. Two things you need to be aware of. One is if you take it and you have a history of blood pressure, you have to talk to you, you have to let us know because it can increase someone's blood pressure. So this is medication works really well. This is probably the newer one where you don't get the side effects of dry eyes, constipation, or dry mouth. All right. So basically the way we look at it is we start with an alpha blocker or daily Cialis, and then we kind of move on based on that, on how you're doing. So usually most of my patients will end up on one or two medications. And once we realize patient symptoms aren't controlled, then it's now time to talk about surgery. So this is a really busy slide, but basically we're going to go over some kind of big options for surgical management. But you can see on the top right, I mean, to say there are uh, you know, more than one way to skin a cat is an understatement. So all these options work, but a lot of it depends on a few things. One is the size of your prostate, the side effect profile, what works for you, surgeon experience, and also what the patient wants. Some patients, for example, want to minimize uh, risks of um, you know, ejec uh, ejaculatory problems. So that's why we would pick certain things. So again, so these are some of the indications for prostate surgery. It's very similar to the slide I showed earlier, but basically it's bladder stones, infections, blood in the urine, you can't urinate, and kidney failure from the bladder being too full. So we'll talk about some surgical options. So we'll start from kind of what I call least, like what they call minimally invasive um, options to kind of more invasive. So one option is called Resume. So that's been FDA approved for about seven years now. Um, and what it is, is it uses water vapor. Actually, we inject steam into the prostate. So you're asleep. Typically, it could be done in the office or under sedation. And we actually look in your penis with a camera. And then what we do is when we get to your prostate, I'll show you a picture in one second. We actually use a little, it's almost like a tooth that comes out like a fang of a snake. We inject steam in different parts of your prostate. And what happens is that steam over a matter of three months actually causes a prostate tissue to shrink internally. So it creates a channel. So you go from the before picture where the urethra is being squeezed to the after picture where it's more open. The reason why this works well, a lot of men like it is you almost have no risk of incontinence. The risk of, of a erectile dysfunction, not ejaculating is very low. Um, in addition, why it's important to measure prostate size, you can only really use it for patients whose prostates are around 80 grams. So that's why you have to have an ultrasound done before we do this to make sure you're a candidate. And so you can see, we use our little device and it's almost like a little thing that goes into the prostate. The procedure actually doesn't take very long. Each treatment's nine seconds, but we end up doing, depending on how big the prostate is, about five or six treatments. You do need to have a catheter where you drain the urine for about two days to let the prostate heal afterwards. So now this is another minimally invasive therapy. This is called a Urolift. So this is where we put implants through the urethra, again, through the penis, which causes the lateral lobes of the size of the prostate to be pushed back. So think of in your house when you open curtains up, that's what this is doing. It's basically opening up the curtains of the prostate. So the reason we like to do this is, again, it minimizes the risk of incontinence, uh, retrograde ejaculation, and erectile dysfunction. Now, these are permanent. They can be removed if you do another surgery. Usually they don't, they, some of the things that can happen is they can get dislodged, you can form stones, um, but you still need a catheter two days afterwards. It can be used for almost any size prostate, about 100 grams, and also if you have a piece of prostate tissue growing into your bladder. So this is another one that can be done in office or with sedation. So what happens is the before, and then you see the clips, it kind of compresses the prostate tissue, and that creates a larger channel. So now 
The next one is kind of what we call the gold standard. This has probably been around, I know, more than I've been alive. Um, but this is called a TERP. So a lot of my older patients, I'll talk to them about like a rotor rooter, so to speak. So this is kind of where we go through the, um, the urethra once again. And what we do is we actually scrape out tissue. So we're actually physically removing tissue, and that's creating a channel. That is done in the hospital. And usually most patients have to stay one night because there's a little bit of risk of bleeding. So we keep you in one night in the hospital. You um, will have a catheter usually for two days. Uh, typically, you know, the reason, you know, some of the things you look out for for this procedure is a higher risk of uh, uh, um, erection issues afterwards, slight more risk of incontinence, scar tissue. So for patients who's who, for example, may have had a resume or had a urolift lift that didn't work, this would be one of the options to consider. And so this is just a little picture. How we use actually a little, it's just a, it's a half circle, and that half circle delivers a cutting current and then a current to actually stop the bleeding. And so it just kind of scrapes out the prostate tissue. So you start with that bottom left picture where there's, there's a blockage, and at the end you end up with a kind of a, almost a, like you're coring an apple. And that's what, the, that's what a TERP is. So another way to kind of take out a lot of tissues where you use a laser. So there are different types of lasers. So one laser is called a green light laser. And that's because when, you, uh, when you're in the room, it looks uh, neon, it's bright uh, green. The reason why we do this versus a TERP, for example, is it has a little bit less risk of bleeding and typically you can go home the same day. We usually use this for prostates around 80 grams, maybe 100 at the most, um, because we want to make sure we're able to get enough tissue out. So this is just a picture. So you can see on the left, again, you can see kind of the, the prostate kind of squeezing, and then you're using this fiber, and it creates this, um, basically this large defect, and this tissue is all kind of burnt tissue that you did with the, with the laser. And this all heals. So in a few months, if we were to look in, it would just look like a normal urethra, like nice, healthy tissue, but it does take about three months for it to, uh, to work. Uh, now, Afterwards, it's very common after this procedure to have a little bit more burning. So you'll have it like when you urinate, you'll see some blood in the urine and you'll also have burning. That gets better. It just takes some time. Now, the other one that you can do is what they call a, a nucleation. So this is using a different laser where you actually take out more prostate tissue by using, it's just a different technology. So same idea as you're trying to just take out as much tissue as you can. So this one, usually, again, one night in the hospital, having a catheter, this is not done as frequently. It's relatively new, but it's become more and more people are doing it. Um, so this is another great option for bigger prostates. This one can be done almost on any size prostate, whether it's, uh, you know, size of a walnut or it's the size of a tennis ball. People can have this done. So that's one of the benefits of this uh, procedure as well. So now probably the most aggressive procedure we have is where we call a simple prostatectomy. That's where either robotically or, or through an open incision, we actually open up the bladder and then we actually, using our finger or the robot, we actually core out the tissue. So think of a grapefruit. So we keep the shell of the grapefruit, but literally we, we're taking all the fruit on the inside. And so this is really reserved for people who have very large prostates where you can't take out tissue through a TERP or a laser. So this is kind of for patients whose prostates are really over 100 grams. This you can do on any size prostate. So this is probably the most kind of invasive option, but it works very well in men with big prostates. And so this is just basically an illustration of us kind of coring out the prostate and then um, at the end we, we close everything up. But this, is a, this procedure works well, but it's only for select men. Um, and so we make sure we do a lot of studies to see if you're a candidate for this. So these are basically the risks of prostate surgery. So you can actually go, you think we're helped by getting rid of retention, but some men go have a problem urinating immediately after surgery. The reason that happens is there's a lot of swelling after the surgery. So sometimes you need to have a catheter put in for another few days and then it'll improve and then we'll, you'll avoid incontinence. So the muscle that keeps you dry is called the sphincter and it's very close to the prostate. So that's why who men who actually have their prostates removed for prostate cancer, they actually have leakage because that can get injured. So the same thing when we do our surgery. 
uh, stricture. So what that is, is if your urethra is normally this size, just by going with a camera, it can get scarred down. So you can be like, I'm urinating great. And six months later or a year later, you're like, why is my stream weak? And we can look in and we can see that instead of the urethra being like this, it's, it's now like the size of this. That can be fixed as well. We just stretch it and it opens up. Bladder neck contracture, it's an, again, it's just another type of uh, narrowing. Blood in the urine. So sometimes you can bleed after surgery that we need to either put a catheter in or it heals by itself. Infection and irritated symptoms. So a lot of patients will come to me saying, I'm, I'm having a lot of burning or urgency. That's because your prostate's healing and your bladder's healing. And it'll take time, but it does improve. So in general, sometimes what happens is about 20% of men will still have some residual symptoms after surgery, meaning let's say, you know, you had urgency before the surgery. Sometimes people continue to have urgency, or if you were getting up at night, let's say five times, you, you still may get up twice a night. So some symptoms do remain ev even after prostate surgery. So what we do in those cases, we do that uh, test to see the function. And we also look inside again, because maybe there's more tissue, maybe there's scar tissue that explains it. So there's always some more testing we can do to see if why people may have not had the outcome we wanted. So that's really about like prostate. Um, I know it's a very quick talk, but basically, you know, when we talk about prostate management, it really starts conservatively with medication. And then we go to surgery for people who want it. Some men are very happy taking medication and they want to continue it. And that sounds, and that's great. Some men symptoms are controlled with medication, but they don't like the side effects. So then they would want surgery. And then there are other men who, despite the medications, have a progression of their symptoms. And then at that point, there would be surgical candidates. So there's no right answer for this. It's all dependent on the conversation you have with your doctor and what you would prefer as well. All right, so we'll switch gears to um, erectile dysfunction. I want. I know you guys are gonna probably ask questions, so I'll, I'll get through this. But erectile dysfunction is, you know, there's never one answer of why it happens, you know. Um, a lot of times it's multifactorial. So some of the things you look at is medications. So almost any blood pressure pill you take can cause um, erectile dysfunction. Some of the more common ones are if anyone takes what they call a beta blocker, um, low pressor, metoprolol. Um, these are very common medications. It's They're well known to cause this problem. So we, usually if... We can talk to your cardiologist. Sometimes there are less there are medications that may cause it less often. You can change it, but you have to be. I'm always worried because if you're really if your blood pressure is really controlled, I don't like to change your medications because sometimes it took you maybe three different medications to get it uh, controlled. Um, if someone takes antidepressants, for example, um, that can lead to it. Um, Antiandrogens. So if someone's being treated for prostate cancer. A lot of the medications we use for that actually decreases your testosterone levels, and that will actually lead to problems with erections as well. Um, if someone takes anti-anxiety medications like Xanax, um, Ativan, sometimes those can lead to it as well. Also, their lifestyle, obesity. So again, it, just like how your prostate gets enlarged with um, being a little bit overweight, it also affects erections. Um, smoking for sure affects erections. So just how smoking can be a risk factor for someone developing heart disease and their arteries that feed their heart. Same thing for the arteries that go to your penis. I mean, these are like the, the arteries to your heart, the Holland tunnel. I mean, this, the, you know, the ones to your penis are like a, you know, like a pencil compared to that. So if there's any kind of, um, you know, calcium buildup or plaque buildup, you can um, have an effect. So that's why tobacco is a concern. Recreational drug use, marijuana, for example, can have an effect. Heavy alcohol consumption as well, that can also affect uh, erectile dysfunction. Um, so those are some of the things. Age plays a role, for example. Um, you know, stress plays a role. Um, so we even see patients in their 20s with it, uh, you know, coming because of some stresses. So all, there's a lot of different things that lead to erection issues. But a lot of times we can overcome a lot of this. So just some more causes, so vasculogenic. So what that means is you're not getting enough blood flow. That could be from tobacco, uh, injury, for example. Neurogenic, so people with neurologic disorders can actually develop um, 
uh, issues with erections. If someone had trauma, they can have issues, surgery. For example, people have spine surgeries and some people actually, when they go, instead of going through the back, they go through the front. Um, and in those cases, it actually leads to problems with erections as well. So even certain surgeries can lead to erection issues. Um, even prostate surgery, like I said. Um, hormonal, um, so if someone has low testosterone, about 10% of men with low testosterone will have erectile dysfunction. So there's some patients who will have their testosterone increase with medications and they start having better erections. And then diabetes is a very big one. So diabetes works in two ways. One is it works because you can get impaired blood flow, but also if you have neuropathy, so meaning if you have where you can't feel your fingertips well or your toes, um, that can also affect the nerves going to your penis, and so then that can also affect erections. So those are some of the um, other um, kind of how we categorize it. And so the treatment options, next slide. All right, so oral agents. So these are all the ones that kind of people know about. So Viagra, the blue pill. Now you really can't find Viagra. It's all, everything's generic. So um, Sidenafil is a generic. Uh, and then you have Cialis, which is still generic. That's called Tadalafil, Levitra, and Stendra. These are really the main, the four main ones. I would say the top two are probably the best ones that work that work the best. The benefit of um, Cialis is it's, I call it the weekend drug. It has a half-life of 72 hours. So you take it on Friday, you're good for the weekend. Um, yeah, you won't be walking around with an erection the whole time, but um, but so that one's good. So that's why I, I like, I usually prefer that one. Viagra, again, that's probably been the most studied. Now, some of the side effects of these so one is you need to make sure you're not taking any nitrates for your heart. Two is if you have a hard time going upstairs, like you get very short of breath very quickly, it's important that I usually have someone see their cardiologist or their primary doctor first to make sure it's safe to take it. Um, people can get headache when they take it, a flushed feeling. You can feel like your heart's racing sometime, upset stomach. I mean, these are all possibilities, but in general, most of my most men do very well with either one or two, either one of them. So, for example, they may not tolerate the Viagra, but the Cialis works great. So we'll just continue that. Unfortunately, you can't take two. You can't take like Viagra and Cialis at the same time. Um, that actually will drop your blood pressure too low. So we don't have you do that. Um, the other benefit of Cialis is you can eat on it. So you can go out for dinner, eat, and then take it. With Viagra, uh, synthetically, you have to actually take it on an empty stomach. Because having a big meal, going out to one of your dinners that you're talking about, and then taking the pill, probably not a good idea. So make sure you take that, uh, you give some time for the food to digest beforehand. But these are really what we what the first line medications are. And again, it works just by getting more blood flow to the penis. So now we're going to, so these are some kind of more invasive options. So what intracavernosal injection means, we actually can give a medication that you inject into the penis directly. So it's, it's a small amount and we, um, it's a different medication that helps basically get more blood flow directly to the penis. So you inject it on the, let's say your left side of your penis and your penis is like a sponge. The medicine goes all over into the penis and then you get an erection basically. This, the erections can range from 20 minutes to two hours, depending on how much you take. Um, the only thing I tell patients is if it lasts more than four hours, just like Viagra, it's not a party, you have to call me, unfortunately, and we'll have a date in the emergency room. Um, but that works very well. For people who take blood thinners, if you take Coumadin, Warfarin, where your blood gets thin, you have to be very careful using this because it's like anything, if you make an injection, you can get bleeding or bruising, so you have to hold pressure after you take it. So that works well. Intraurethral therapy. So there are actually these little pills you can actually put into the urethra where you pee from. Into, and then that works the same way as it dissolves. And as it dissolves, it actually uh, gets into the penis and then it gives you an erection that way. Most men, we don't use that because it causes a lot of burning with urination. So if they're going to try something, they'll try the, um, they'll try the, uh, the top one. The other thing is, I know it sounds crazy to actually inject your penis with a needle, but I promise you the needle is about that big. If anyone has ever seen a diabetic needle, if they inject insulin, the needle is about the same size. So it's about that big and it's very thin. So um, it works well. It's just, I think the biggest fear is actually just injecting yourself, which I understand completely. But that's usually what we would recommend after doing um, 
after doing the oral agent. The, the one thing I didn't put is you can also do a vacuum device. So that works by negative pressure. So you place your penis in a vacuum device, get and then you get an erection. And you have to put a ring at the bottom so you can maintain the erection. The problem with that is the head of the penis gets a little purple and it's and you lose sensation when you do it. So it's not the most ideal option. And if you take it on your carry-on, you'll probably get stopped by TSA. And then the last thing is what they call a penile prosthesis. So this is where we actually put inflatable cylinders in the penis itself. And so you actually almost have a third testicle where you actually can pump up the penis to, to get an erection. So if this is a, a mechanical erection. You have normal sensation, you ejaculate normally, and, you, and it lasts for five minutes or six hours if you want. Because in, and then you, when you're done, you just hit a button and then it, the fluid leaves and the penis goes down. So this option works really well. This probably has the highest satisfaction rate of any option, but it is surgery. So for many men, they it's uh, you know they would they don't want to have the surgery. But satisfaction over probably ninety nine percent of patients who have it are very happy with it. Do you have the next one? And this is um, I think a picture of what it looks like next. So what it is is those cylinders actually go into your penis, and that pump at the bottom will sit inside your scrotum and that big reservoir at the top that actually we actually put that into your right by your bladder and so what happens you just pump up the um pump up the device and it goes from like you know those uh, zodiac boats that you see you basically go from that to like a zodiac boat and then and then when you're done you deflate it and then and then you can go back to bed but anyway, that is that is one kind of prosthesis. The other one is what they call malleable. It's almost like, you know, Gumby. It's almost like Gumby. You can kind of make it flat and then you can make it hard. You can put it up. So that is another option that's le least invasive, but you don't get the rigidity um, uh, as you do when you use one of these, um, as, one, as you do one of this. So now it doesn't make your penis longer. A lot of people ask me that. It doesn't do that. I wish if I if I figured that out, I'd probably be in you know you know I'd not be doing this anymore. Um, but there is actually, but what it can do is actually can increase girth a little bit, um, the width, but it can increase length. So that's basically I think the last thing in terms of you know options for erections. There's some things coming down the pipe. You know, in Europe they actually have a um, a cream. We don't have that here, but there are some other options uh, that you know. You know, every guy's trying to figure out what the next best thing is for this. But that's kind of the the brief discussion discussion on like prostate enlargement and um, erectile dysfunction. Yeah, so that's it. So does anyone have any questions for a few minutes? So it's actually, they've done studies where actually taking the combination, some combinations work better than taking them alone. So there's a big study called the MTOP study where people taking uh, uroxetrol and finasteride did better when, uh, when patients didn't take uh, them together. So yeah, so you can take combination. I have patients who take Tamsulosin and uh, Cialis together. So yeah, you can take them in combination. So medications can stop working. And the reason they do is someone's prostate's, you know, as a prostate's enlarging, sometimes the medications have less than an effect. Yeah. No, so if you look at your, good question. So if you look at ages, so zero to four is kind of just in general. But uh, for example, you can say an 80 a person in their 80s, their PSA could be high, as high as six and a half and be considered normal. For example, the concern is, let's say it's always been six. It's if it's always been six and a half in your age, that's fine. But let's say it was like two and then it went to six and a half. That's a concern. So, yeah. So age related numbers. So when you're 50, it really should be close to under three and a half even though you know so if someone sees me and it's a little bit higher that's still abnormal so yeah you can eat there's some age adjusted requirements so 65 it could be up to four and a half for example so there's some age related uh, numbers we do change at uh, what age do you stop giving the uh, digital examination you know it's funny most of my patients want it 
I'm just kidding. No, um, usually they ask for it. I feel like I'm like, they're coming to see me. I feel like I should do something. No. Um, so typically, you know, we talk about PSA screening. They usually recommend, there's certain guidelines that recommend stopping at 75. You know, my feeling is if you're a good 75, you're healthy, you're exercising, you know, you could have a longer life expectancy of 10 years. So I, at least I have the conversation of at least checking the PSA in a prostate exam, um, but around 75. You know, there are some people who come in in their 60s, you know, stroke, heart attack. You know, while some people come in in their 70s, they look great. You know, I'm still going to check the PSA, especially if they're taking medication or they have symptoms. Day, should you uh, take medic? Yeah, typically, finasteride can be in the morning. We tell most patients to take their Tamsulosin or their Flomax in the evening because of the risk of dizziness. The Flomax is usually in the evening after dinner. Yeah. It could be yeah, after, di uh, before, after dinner, before bedtime is fine in that, in that range. Mm. So, yeah, so there's some things that can cause this, uh, a, a higher lab value. So intercourse could be one of them. I've actually had people who are competitive bike riders, and I've seen that actually affect the PSA. Um, you know, I wouldn't get your colonoscopy the day before you got your PSA done, just because that irritation can cause it. Um, if you're having, you know, uh, you know, a lot of like GI symptoms, like I've had a lot of people with like uh, um, gastroenteritis where they're having a lot of diarrhea, things like that. So yeah, certain things can affect the PSA value. Uh, you know, you, you know, yeah. I mean, typically, you know what I usually do, we usually recheck it. And if it's high, or let's say it comes back out of your, you know, out of range for you, you know, then usually we say, oh, is there, was there anything that changed or anything different, you know, but it doesn't, you know, uh, I usually, you know, unless it's, you know, multiple times, I haven't seen much. I mean, I have some patients who want their, pro their PSA done before their prostate exam, because they think that can affect the, the, the read, you know, but Usually, I don't see a significant change when I, I've done that. So in general, you can, you can check your PSA. If it's high, then I'm like, okay, well, why, you know, what was going on if it's higher than your baseline? Then I'll have that discussion. Yes. No. Actually, we usually recommend that if you, let's say you have low-grade cancer, you're thinking about therapy, we actually recommend getting surgery before you get radiation. If, for a few reasons. One is the certain risks after are higher after radiation, like incontinence, scar tissue formation, because you don't want to heal as well after radiation. And the second thing is um, that you can't do surgery after radiation for at least six months. So that's, so that's why if someone has significant urinary symptoms before, we usually recommend having treatment. Like, you know, um, if you're going to get radiation, let's just say, you can have surgery in your prostate before. Resume, turb, whichever, you wouldn't have uh, anything you would want. I mean, there's sometimes where you do a terp surgery and you actually, when you look at the specimen, you can find cancer, even if someone has a normal PSA. So you can even still find, that's how um, they used to find it before PSA testing, where they would do TERPs on everyone and they'd find cancer just by the, in the specimen. Uh, how do you prevent kidney stones? Prevent kidney stones? So the best way to prevent them in this country is hydration, is drinking water. Um, adding lemon to your water is really good um, and staying away from high oxalate foods. So that would include uh, spinach, uh, berries. I don't know anyone who eats a rhubarb, but rhubarb, um, vitamin C. So yeah, if you get juice, if you take orange juice, that's fine. But if you take orange juice, then you take extra vitamin C tablets. The vitamin C actually gets, um, metabolized into something called oxalate, which leads to kidney stones. Nuts is a big one. Nuts is a, another one that a lot of people don't realize, but nuts cause can lead to kidney stones. And, um, the other one is chocolate. Yeah. 
Well, listen, if you look online about kidney stones and the diet, you'll never have anything. You'll like, you'll, you'll just drink water your whole life. So what I usually tell patients is you just have to moderate. So if someone, if you have, you have a bowl of nuts every day, when you get home with the drink, you should probably maybe not do that every day or eat just uh, like half. Right. So certain things are too good to give up in life. So you just have to try to moderate it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things is, is sometimes trying to limit your, your water intake is important because it does reduce it for sure helps with getting up less at night because that water has to go somewhere. So that's one of the things. So usually I say about two hours, obviously a lot of people take their medications at night. So we understand that with sips of water, you have to take your medications. Like, you know, your symbiosis, if your cholesterol medications you take in the evening, normally, you know, your symbostatins you usually take. So those are, you know, we know that, but you try to limit, you know, cause I have patients who continue to drink water or tea or coffee before they go to bed. And, you know, when you're younger, you can have tea and coffee before you sleep and you're fine. But as you get older, your bladder gets more irritable. And so you need to just watch what you drink a little bit. Oh. For what? Kidney stones are just in general. Yeah. So it's good, but you have to just be careful with juices in general. So a lot of juices have a lot of sugar. And so it's actually, it's, it's the, so you have to be careful with even though, so for example, cranberry pill, cranberry juice, a lot of my patients take it because of kidney stones, it can help or urinary tract infections. We have to be careful if you drink the ocean spray cranberry juice, it's literally just a, a you know, a cup of sugar, you know, so you have to just be careful. So that way, then if you do it, I have my patients usually dilute it like 50, 50, at least, and at least then it's not as sugary. Okay. So you can. So typically, Flom yes, Flomax um, can be increased from one pill to two pills. So usually we don't start with two pills right away because if you're not used to it and you take two pills, you'll definitely drop your blood pressure. So usually we see how someone does with one pill. And then if, depending on how you're doing, we can increase it to two. So again, it depends on how severe your symptoms are in terms of uh, how many pills you should take of Flomax. Hi, Doc. I got a, a little bit of a case study and a couple of questions. Okay. One question was, um, Medicare stops paying for PSA tests at a certain point. Is that not so? Once a year. They'll only pay once a year. Once right? a year. After to a certain age. I, you know what? That's a good question. I, I'm not aware. Okay. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. The reason I wanted to give you the study is it was a family member. And I don't know exactly what age they did stop, but they stopped doing PSA tests for him. He ended up dying from cancer of the prostate. Um, but they found it very, very late because they hadn't been testing. Correct. He'd been complaining of back pain for years. Mm. And uh, what they actually found was he had a, a super high level of prostate and his cancer. Um, fortunately enough, uh, he lived to be a hundred and almost 102. <laughs> ESAs. Yes. Yeah. So the way I look at PSA is I look at it as a, as a screening test. I new, normally don't rush to any kind of biopsy or anything. If someone has one number, I usually either think about a repeating it or B now we have other op studies that we can do that are more specific. So for example, a lot of us, uh, a lot, we order a prostate MRIs now. So prostate MRI gives us uh, anatomic um, knowledge that just a PSA won't, and it's your own anatomy. The other benefit is you get a score. You get a, it's a, it's a associated with a score from one to five. So one and two is clinically significant cancer unlikely to be present, while four or five is suspicious. So that's another way when someone has a high PSA, we try to figure out, okay, how concerned do we need to be? So that's one test we do. So the other one is something called a 4K test. So that's another blood test where it looks at four things in your blood, including PSA. And the good thing about that test is you get a percentage score. So from 0% to 100%. And it looks at your age, if you ever had a biopsy, how your prostate feels. And what it is, is basically your risk of having aggressive cancer 
which is, uh, you know, um, by Gleason seven over, you know, at that period of time. So let's say you get a score, let's say your PSA is five and you have a score of 1%. So that means one out of a hundred men, if I did a biopsy would have aggressive cancer. Well, if your score is 40%, it's 40 men out of a hundred. So in that case, I would probably tell you, yeah, we should do a biopsy. While in that other case, we may just choose to watch it. So the way I look at PSA is it's just a um, opening test, but then we have other things that can be, that are more specific to enlargement or cancer that can help guide us and decide if we, how worried we need to be. No, no, if your PSA is like, say 0.4, I'm not going to do that. The I mean, there's a chance you can have, that's a problem with PSA. Someone can have cancer with a PSA with the normal limits of one or, or with two, for example, two and a half. Well, someone with a PSA of eight doesn't have cancer, right? So that's, so how do we differentiate between those people? So the way we do it is by doing some of the, like an MRI of the prostate, for example, will tell us, or we do a special 4K score. So that's, um, so you're right. So PSA is not, it's very sensitive. So meaning it rules everything in, but you can't rule out cancer. So that's why we do these other tests. Yeah. It's slightly more, it's slightly more than a laser, but not significantly. You know, a lot of it depends when you do certain procedures is, you know, how the surgeon, you know, how many the surgeon has done or what they feel comfortable with doing, you know, but in general, I would tell you that they're very similar terp and laser in terms of their, uh, their complications. Correct. Well, no, so what we figured out is, so one of the now treatments we use more for uh, prostate cancer is what they call active surveillance, which is where someone is diagnosed with cancer, but it's low grade. So we actually are now watching more men who have these low grade cancers and treating because yeah, it's not one in a thousand, but to cure one person, you'd have to treat over 500 men. And to prevent one death, you'd have to treat over 500 men. So the question is, is, you know, do you have to treat every person that walks in your door? Do you have to check a PSA on every person that walks through your door? And that's the dilemma. That's like, that's kind of more of an art. You have to decide with the patient. That's why the, all our guidelines saying you have to have a, a, you know, informed discussion with your patient about the risks and benefits of PSA testing. But yeah, so you, so we do probably over treat prostate cancer, but that's why we, I do check. That's why we do do active surveillance. But then the, you know, the other question is then you have like your, you know, for your, your case study where someone is fine and you don't check a PSA and then, you know, next time you see their PSA is a thousand, which I've had patients with. So it's, it's a, it's a kind of, uh, you know, it's a delicate balance. Yes. So unfortunately, an, an MRI or one of these newer blood tests, all it can do is just give you an idea if there's cancer, but we still need tissue. So there's no liquid biopsy just yet, but we do do the biopsy slightly differently now. So the old way, which we still do sometimes, it was called transrectal. So we actually go, th you place an ultrasound probe in the rectum and then take samples. We actually, and the risk of that was infection because you can imagine you're going through the rectum. Now we actually do what they call transperineal prostate biopsies, which is where uh, actually the skin behind your scrotum and in front of your anus, we actually, uh, we actually, we actually do biopsies there now. It actually is just a different way uh, to do biopsies, but it's like a less risk of infection. So we still need to do prostate biopsies. What procedure? Uh, so high protein in the urine is a little bit different. So if someone has high protein in the urine, that's not necessarily all related to uh, prostate. So when someone has, so think about your kidneys as like a filter. 
So your kidney should have very fine filter where things like protein, which is really large, shouldn't come in your urine. So if you have protein in your urine, that's actually a sign actually of underlying kidney disease, not prostate disease necessarily. So for example, someone with blood pressure that's not well controlled or someone who's had it for a long time, diabetes, for those are some things that can lead to protein in the urine. So you don't necessarily have to have surgery on that. You have to see a nephrologist. So something like that would be basically, you know, you check your kidney function to make sure the kidneys are working. So that's called a BMP. It's you'll call your creatinine. You check that. It depends. So it depends on how high your creatinine, the kidney function is and what your risk factors are. So yes, yeah, sometimes you have to do a biopsy to see why your kidney function, why the creatinine number changed. Um, but that depends on, you know, what the person's medical history is or what they're thinking, you know, because sometimes you can have these reversible things where you don't need to necessarily have a biopsy. It may be as simple as changing a medication you're on because blood pressure pills can affect it. So sometimes if you're taking a water pill, like a diuretic, sometimes changing that dose can actually change your, the level of your creatinine or the protein without needing a biopsy. So why, why? Uh, so if they sometimes if they don't have an answer uh, for why you know the creatinine has gone up that's one of the reasons why they do it um if they're worried about um uh, certain there's certain syndromes you know i'm not a spe uh, as expert in uh, you know nephrology but like there's certain syndromes people can have where you actually want to do a biopsy to diagnose it so there's certain reasons it's not very common it's not as common to do kidney biopsies but there are some reasons <laughs>